Hi, it's time for another look at a soldering station. This time we've got the brand spanking new Pace ADS 200 AccuDrive. Thank you very much Pace for uh, sending this one in. It is a new low cost, no it's not on, uh, direct heat um, iron and I've done a video explaining the difference between uh, direct heat irons which are much better than your traditional ones. I recommend it if you can afford it. Anyway, um, it's, it was released actually some time back earlier in the year. So when they first came out there was quite a lot of buzz about this and uh, Cliff Matthews on the EEV blog forum uh, got hold of an early unit but then he started reporting uh, issues with the tips i.e. Uh, they weren't making uh, contact inside here or something like that I don't know I, I didn't follow the whole thing Pace uh, to their credit uh, acknowledged the problem and they didn't I don't think they actually recorded it but they stopped shipment of them I think they hadn't shipped too many at that point and they said hey let us look into it they investigated it and fixed the uh, issues and they are now reshipping so that took like uh, three months to uh, take care of all that business so I love it when companies do that like they take responsibility for their products they directly on the forums and they acknowledge the problems and they fix them and you know everyone knows that uh, you know stuff happens and it's what companies do to fix the problems when they uh, come up that really uh, shows what they're like anyway that's what you'd expect pace an american company they've been around since well, like 50 years or something from day dot of uh modern soldering and they are one of the top tier brands if you haven't heard of pace maybe if you're in europe or something you know you're more familiar with jbc or one of the other uh european biggies but uh yeah pace are uh, one of the big american manufacturers and yes usa 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 so let's take a look at the new ADS 200 AccuDrive base unit, 130 watts uh, capability, and a matching 130 watt new designed uh, TD 200 iron. So it comes in two models. The base unit uh, doesn't have this extra uh, cable at the back. This is the setback model, it's called, which when you automatically put the iron in here, it senses it, and after a small time delay, it uh, reduces the power to increase the longevity of the tips. So the base model unit without that is about uh, 240 US dollars, although street price is currently about 220 bucks. So that puts it right on par with the likes of the FXR 951 and substantially cheaper than the uh, competing JBC one, the JBC 2B unit, uh, which is also an equivalent watt uh, unit at 130 watts, and that's much more expensive at like uh, 400 plus dollars. So this is actually really quite remarkable to get a top brand name uh, soldering station made in the USA with the um, instant heat tip technology for like just over 200 bucks. Absolutely amazing. And thanks to Pace, they supplied a huge range of tips here. So I've got no shortage of them. Uh, they come in the ultra performance type and also the uh, standard uh, tips as well. And the other good thing is the price of the tips matches the price of the unit. They start from just over 10 bucks, 10, 11 dollars for the uh, all of the standard uh, tips, I think. And even, but even the uh, high capacity ultra performance tips, they range from like, uh, I don't know, 14 bucks to 7 bucks or something like that so the tips are really cheap they're like what a third of the price of the JBC ones which are just crazy so right off the bat from a uh, price and uh, maintenance point of view um, uh, i.e. buying uh, new tips and stuff this is a really cheap unit but look at this isn't it sexy as all alien like extruded aluminium construction and listen to this die-cast alloy, none of that plastic rubbish. So this is absolutely fantastic. So this feels absolutely first-class quality, built like a brick dunny, I love it. I think it's stackable, because they've got the curve on the top, the matching curve on the bottom, and the big feet, I think, although I don't have a second one, if you put a second one on top, I'm sure they thought of that, then they would uh, stack nicely. And it's quite actually quite common to have uh, two irons, because you know, if you wanna get in there and you don't have uh, the SMD twin, you want to get in there with two irons and flip some parts off and stuff like that. Very handy. So I'm sure they've uh, thought of the stacking part of that. So that's by far the best quality soldering iron I think I've stationed I've ever seen, really, and especially for the price. It's absolutely remarkable. Um, anyway, it does use a uh, screw-on DIN connector for the um, iron. Yes, it is plastic. I would have uh, preferred some sort of metal, but uh, that's, you know, it's par for the course. So it goes in there well enough and nice, feels 
fairly solid when it's locked in place. Uh, three digit readout and just your basic temperature up down and preset. Nice. Standard IEC mains input, a uh, little DIN connector for your instant setback uh, iron. You either uh, buy that for like 30 bucks extra. I'd recommend it. Like if you're spending a couple of hundred bucks, spring for the extra 30 and get the instant uh, setback one. It's well worth it. Grounding, if you want to uh, connect it through to your um, ground mat and your grounding system, no worries. And the tool stand here, I rather like it. It's got a fair bit of heft to it. Um, it's angled fairly well to get in there like that. As you can sort of like throw the, oh, I missed it. So I guess you could. Maybe I would have preferred the angle a little bit down like that, perhaps further. Um, it's not adjustable. So there's nothing, if you don't like the angle, yeah, there's no, oh, maybe you could get in there and I don't know, put something under there and <laughs> manually tweak the um, angle of that if you wanted to hack it. And it's got uh, space for all your tips to uh, whack in the back there. No worries. We've got both the uh, steel wool and the sponge as well. The steel wool holders, actually, you can pull that out. So, you know, if you don't like your steel wool, I like having uh, both. Um, it's kind of like... <laughs> it's kind of like not quite big enough for... Like, I've got to really push that in there. So you probably want to... I'm not going to want to use all your steel wool. Hmm, anyway, just cl clips in there. That's a very nice tool stand. I like it. Now, the only problem I have with this is that you can see in there, there's a little micro switch pushes in like that. So none of this magnet rubbish, good old micro switch, that when you insert that, that just switches off and that's your auto setback technology in there as a micro switch. You know, if you let it sort of fall in, well, that one didn't go all the way, so that didn't engage it. You've got to let it fall all the way in like that. It could fall before that micro switch and not actually set it back. So, yeah, it's a bit how you're doing. I think they missed the boat a bit there. And as for the new uh, TD200 iron, I rather like it. It's got, it feels kind of, it's got like rubbery around uh, blue anodized aluminium there. And it's got a very nice uh, short um, grip to tip distance. I love that. There's nothing worse than having it long like this and just the angles don't work. You want to be really close to your work. You can get much more accuracy on there. And these are the new uh, tips to go along with it. I believe, you know, they had some issue with the uh, manufacturing tolerance of the contacts in there or something and they weren't making uh, proper contact. So these are integrated tip uh, cartridges, which means that the uh, temperature sensor is built into this. So every time right at the tip, right near the element so it can deliver, uh, um, the power much faster and uh, the control loop is much better for that and I've done a video on that can't see anything else uh, down in there I can't take that apart so sorry about that anyway they are keyed just slide them in there like that no wackers feels nice and tight tight as a nun's nasty and let's whip the back off here um, they do have a grommet here this is probably my only it's not really a gripe it's just it's not the best strain relief I've seen, I mean, that's, you know, it's nicely engineered, but, you know, it doesn't have the nice molded rubber coming out like that. See, there you go, there's the JBC one, and you can see the rubber on the end is just like, you know, that's just much sexier. And if you want to know, like, if you want a quick comparison between these two, I probably prefer the JBC in terms of uh, handling, um, because the uh, cord is further back like this, so it gets out of the way. When you've got your hand there gripping this, like, the cord's just further out of the way with this one. But the new Pace has a significantly shorter uh, grip to tip distance so yeah that's pretty handy although there's nothing wrong with the JBC it's still quite short the cable seems a bit lighter in comparison to the uh, weight of the handle so uh, yeah, although they do use a nice burn uh, proof silicon lead on this it's just not quite as flexible but still that's that's a pretty decent iron I like it oh forgot to mention when you buy this you actually don't get a tip with it tight asses. Um, so maybe some dealers will like throw one in uh, as a bundle, but officially you don't actually get the tip. Unbelievable. At least give us more chisel. Oh. <laughs> anyway, you know what we say here on the EV blog, don't turn it on, take it apart. Right, looks like the front panel is just going to fall away. Expect the controller to be, yeah, attached to the front. There you go. We're in like Flynn. Jeez, there's not much in there, is there? 
Hello. TO220 is uh, somebody, somebody goofed on the TO220. Check it out. Look at that. Just couldn't, uh, couldn't fit it in there. Looks like they're bodged in a heat sink as an afterthought and uh, just flapping around in the breeze. Nah, fail. It's right next to the cap. Like, just move your, look at all the room they got. Move your cap over here. It's not rocket science. Looks like we've got ourselves a uh, SMD current shunt there. Nice. Um, I'm not sure why they need, the, need to know the current going through the thing. Ah, uh, that's the lead on the front. Ah, that must be a uh, bicolor lead. Not much else. Anyway, is that a... Yeah, that is a regulator. It's a 7805. Anyway, the cap is a Nippon Chemicon. Nice. That's not going to last there long, is it? Old school 89C51. And of course, in a matching old school PLCC socket for the win. Well, that's hilarious. Check it out. They couldn't even be bothered to trim them out of the mold there for the... I'm not sure what the stringy bits in the excess moldy bits on there for the rubber buttons. <laughs> hilarious. Anyway, they are nice rubber baby buggy bumpers, so that's great. None of that plastic rubbish. So all that sort of stuff up there is related to the... Is that the drive or temperature sensor? Well, this is interesting. A microchip TC500. This is actually a 17-bit analog to digital converter. Wow, now you know where the name AccuDrive comes from because one of the, uh, the selling points of this thing is that A, it doesn't need calibration and B, it's got, um, you know, very accurate uh, temperature control. So there you go, they're obviously doing that. Well, they need a 17-bit converter in there. Wow, resolution. The other stuff is just some uh, Jelly Bean Logic and uh, LN399 Comparator. Just got some uh, OP177 op amps. And another, whoa, it's a flippy flop. And Pace, one of the old school masters in soldering, have left the flux on the board. Aww. I tell you what, I really don't like the layout of this. Look, we've got four presumably MOSFETs there. And uh, what, are, what is that? I don't know. But, uh, you know, look, they've got to drop this, right? So that's some sort of active bridge rectifier. Right, so they've got to drop this down to the bottom here. These single vias over to here. Another single, like over to here. Like it drops, does it drop down to another via? I don't get it. And the regulator's right here, right in the path where you need to get the high current traces over to the, um, you know, the, the, the heating element cable over here. Well, that just seems like a crazy layout to me. I don't know what the hell's going on there at all. Don't like it. Well, somebody had fun at the Pace Factory in the US. They've probably got some someone who's the uh, czar of crimps, haven't they? Um, they've just gone berserk. Look at that uh, star point there for the for the ground. They've really gone to town. Anyway, that is very nice. And also for the uh, transformer plate, they've gone to the effort to put like another plate down there. Not just, uh, and all star washes, everything else, all crimped nicely. It's just, it's beautifully constructed. No worries. And that transformer just uh, slides out of there. And let me tell you, that looks like the duck's guts. Beautiful. Well, that's really uh, nicely engineered, apart from the <laughs> PCB, which is kind of weird. I'm not sure what's going on there. Anyway, let's check out the performance of this baby. And just be careful, this is the 230 volt unit. It is not switchable. You have to get the correct uh, transformer for your region. And what's all this Imperial rubbish? Look at this, 164, 132, 364. Give me a break. Bloody hell. 332, it's, uh, one quarter. Yeah, 1364, yeah, 164. Yeah, good on you. But there's one rebel there. Look at that. 2.4 millimeters. The metric rebel at pace. All right, first turn on, here we go. I'll take it out of here so it doesn't do the instant uh, setback. Could have some smoke and switch her on. Once, well, I don't know why it was jumping around there. Yeah, we have smoke. Ah, it's probably set to that Fahrenheit. Whoa, what was that? Jumped around and it said high or something there? Anyway, let's do the sponge test. Yeah. Drops down, not by a huge amount. Yep, not by much. Nice. And by the way, when you put it back in into the auto setback um, 
iron stand. You've got to wait 15 seconds, apparently. Oh, there we go. Flishy flash. Yep, it's flashing to tell you that it's going into auto setback. So we'll let that uh, cool down, see what it cools down to. I think we're in Fahrenheit. Doesn't tell you. That's a problem with the LED display, but I like the simplicity on this. Tell me the bloody temperature, temperature up, down, and some presets. Thank you very much. Okay, it looks like it jumps back to a setback temperature of 180, 175. Still don't know if it's that 7 Fahrenheit or Celsius, but anyway, um, let's see how quickly it heats back up. Don't. Oh, big overshoot. I don't. What? No, hang on. Let's try that again. We're only down to 300. For, it jumps up to 415. Why does it do like? Why does it do that? I find that rather disconcerting. Don't like that at all. See, oh, I'm gonna have to leave it 15 seconds. Bloody hell! Let's do it again. Just uh, went into setback mode. Yeah, uh, 390. Yeah. Does it have really have that overshoot, or is that just some uh, measurement artifact? I don't know. Anyway, let's measure the temperature. Oh, look at that. 370. It's bang on. That is bang on, as you'd expect, from an AccuDrive. But the thing about this is, is that they make the claim that you you can change to any tip you want, any thermal mass, any size, any type of tip. And it is the AccuDrive uh, technology says that you don't never have to calibrate this thing. So it doesn't even have a calibration mode, which is fantastic. Okay, one thing I don't like is that... Um, when you're in setback mode and you adjust the temperature, I would have expected to go out of setback mode and turn on the heater, but it doesn't. So, in, in a small thing, but I, I would have expected it to do that. Anyway, um, 5 degrees Celsius steps, I don't think you can get anything less than that. You hold it in. Ah, oh, yeah, it's got a velocity. Oh, off. There you go. Ooh, look, you can actually turn software off. Nice. What? 260 minimum? What's that bullshit? Let's see what it goes up to. Come on. High, 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 low. Go up there. See, it's in setback mode. I like, I want it to like immediately, uh, to, oh, hi, hi. We're overloading. Thanks for telling us that. Jeez. It seems all over the shop. No, I don't. I think some firmware tweaks might be required. So we're in setback mode, and let's just press that. See, when you go to that, it's you're still in setback mode. Just, like, turn the damn thing on. Why do that? 345, 370, 400. So there are our three temperatures. Okay, cool bananas. Let's go to 400. It's still in setback. Let's go up. There you go, we're back at 400, so it gets there quick enough, but it uh, seems to just jump all over the shop. And if you follow the Quick Start Guide, it's actually really um, quite good. And there are all the programming codes. You hold down the button when you uh, power it on, and you can go into programming mode. So you can set the password, you can set the Celsius and all that sort of jazz. Um, adjust setback timer. Cool! <laughs> if you're annoyed by it. Because, um, like, a lot of people would prefer to have it on all the time. It's only if, like, you leave your iron off and you bugger off for, you know, an hour or overnight or something. If you're one of those people who forget and leave your iron on overnight, you know, you want it to turn off in half an hour or an hour's time or something. Aha! Uh -huh, we may be able to change our low temperature limit. Right! Change temperature preset, set in store back to uh, temperature match. Temperature match? That sounds like calibration. I thought this thing didn't need calibration. Oh, and we found out what our current sense resistor on there was for. Overcurrent error, so if the tip shorts out or uh, something like that. Nice. And they're all the different tips for those playing along at home. And the ultra performance ones. By the way, the only difference between the standard tips here and the high uh, performance tips here is the extra thermal mass inside there. You can see the physical bulge in there. They just, you know, everything's thicker and bigger, so they have a higher thermal mass. They retain the heat better so that when you apply it to the joint, it doesn't dip as much. And really, unless you need to get into fine work, I'd rececommend the higher performance tips. They're like at tops, uh, five dollars more. But don't confuse thermal mass with power. The higher thermal mass premium tips are 130 watts, but your standard ones are also 130 watts. It's just what heat is retained in the physical uh, tip of it. And if you have a look at the manual here, they do claim not lots of stuff, no calibration required, and all the physical aspects of it, but the new acrid... Ac bleh. 
AccuDrive technology, um, and uh, they reckon it's you know super advanced electronics provide instantaneous load sensing on demand power to quick re to quickly reflow solder joints and safe load temperatures regardless of the mass of the application. Well, it's going to have some difference. You can't just claim it as none. That's bullshit. Um, but anyway, yeah, they reckon it's the duck's guts. And the actual iron itself, ultra short tip to grip, all that sort of jazz. Uh, cool touch technology, so you can have your fingers right near the tip like this and eh, not feel a thing. Nice. Sort of the uh, ridge at the front is enough to stop your fingers uh, sliding off the end there. Some people prefer like bigger. But anyway, the uh, cool touch technology, I've got that on 400 uh, Celsius and I can't feel a damn thing with my fingers right on the um, anodized aluminium end. So this cool touch technology, it's very nice. It, it doesn't heat up at all. Is the silicon lead burn proof? Well, there's only one way to find out. Yep, 400 Celsius. Yep, oh, I'm starting to smell sudden. Oh. <laughs> nah, it's good. So I'm now adjusting the uh, low temperature limit like that. And sure enough, yep. Oh, there you go, 177 minimum. Oh, I didn't notice. It's actually got a just setback timer and a just instant setback timer. So it looks like it has regular setback timer plus auto off timer. Very nice. So you don't necessarily have to buy the instant setback iron. You can save 30 bucks and just set it in software. It's probably not quite as flexible, but still. Anyway, the instant setback is minimum. I presume that's in seconds. There you go, 240 seconds. Yeah, no worries. So Pace claimed that this thing has unsurpassed thermal performance. I'm going to take that to mean thermal capacity uh, performance. So let's do a thermal uh, capacity test. Let's compare it with the JBC because all oh, the talk on the forum, as I said, um, is this is this thing a potentially a JBC killer in terms of thermal uh, performance, thermal capacity? So let's try that. Now, the uh, a bit unfair because the JBC is a much more uh, expensive iron, like $400 plus dollar class. Not quite twice as much, but you know near enough so anyway let's give it a go now the way we're going to do this is to actually uh, turn the temperature down so that we can see the differences now um, I'm using uh, my standard uh, Loctite uh, 227 degree uh, nominal melting point lead free solder so let's give it a bowl now you normally wouldn't solder at such a low temperature on a big ground plane like this but let's hey we're going to see the differences so let's go for the JBC first what we'll do is we'll just test the uh, temperature out here on the JBC there we go 280 near enough here we go 280 onto a ground plane. As I said, you normally wouldn't uh, solder at this low a lower temperature and it flows no problem whatsoever at 280. Let's try the pace. And by the way, I've got uh, nearly identical tips as I can get them here. Um, in terms of thermal mass, I'm using the uh, ultra performance one on the pace to give it the absolute uh, best chance. So I think they're pretty equivalent uh, tips. Now, to be fair, the JBC uh, does have 130 watt capability compared to 120 for the pace, but, you know, there's not much in it. And it's bang on. There you go. Yep, <laughs> it's AccuDrive, all right. It's bang on temperature, no worries. And the good advantage of this one is that it doesn't need any calibration at all. That's their claim. You can change the tips uh, from any from standard to the ultra performance with the higher thermal mass, regardless of the size or shape or anything else, and it doesn't require calibration. That's their claim anyway. I, I can try a few different tips and see if that's true, but I, I have no doubt that they uh, uh, know what they're doing there. So, yeah, that's a big advantage. Okay, 280 degrees C, and the pace simply cannot do it. I have tried this uh, several times, but it just it just does not have the perform the thermal performance of the JBC. So it that claim of unmatched thermal performance. Well, I, it's probably marketing bullshit because it's not even close to the JBC. We have to increase the temperature substantially. Let's have a look. Okay, we're up at 300 here. And at 300, it's just getting there. But it's really, it's sticky business. Um, we're going to have to go further than that. Let's go 315. And before we get... 
a similar performance to the JBC. Still a little bit sticky there, but I'm going to call that a similar performance. So it needs to go up by a good, what is that, uh, 35 degrees before it gets a similar performance. So, yep, I'm going to call uh, market, a bit of marketing BS there on that unmatched thermal performance. Maybe, granted, unmatched thermal performance for the price, we'd have to compare it with a similar price system, like maybe the uh, Heiko FX951, uh, um, for example, uh, which is a similar priced unit, but it certainly is not a JBC killer, so that question is answered. But as I said, probably not a fair comparison because this is getting towards twice the price. And it does have 10 watts more uh, capability, but I, I'm going to call them pretty much uh, equivalent. Now, the reason for this um, lack or <laughs> great difference in uh, thermal capacity performance, the ability to get the heat from the tip onto the joint, is um, Pace kind of uh, admit this on the EV blog forum, is that their tips uh, deliberately contain more iron in them, more iron, a thicker iron plating in them. And they do that so that they get a longer tip life, whereas JBC apparently have uh, less iron in them, so less thick and thinner iron plating, so uh, you get the better thermal performance for a given uh, power input. But the problem is, is that the GBCs are a bit known for having a short tip life because of the thin iron plating. Here's one of my old uh, tips. It's the first one that I originally got with it. I've done some pretty horrible things to it, and yeah, I had to get a new one. It's kind of uh, on the way out. It's not great. And given the high price of these, like um, two and a half, maybe even three times the price of the Pace ones, the Pace ones last longer and are cheaper, so have a much lower cost of ownership. So that's a huge benefit. Um, big thumbs up to Pace for the uh, price of these tips. They're very realistic at, you know, 10 to 15 bucks each or whatever. Um, but the trade-off is the thermal performance isn't as good. But like I said, uh, you wouldn't use such a low temperature on something like this. Let's go up to a more standard 270, which Pace uh, uh, claim that, you know, you should basically use for everything. You shouldn't need to go below 270, and I'll talk about that in a minute. And of course, it just, you know, it, it goes through that like it's nothing. So no problem once whatsoever if you're using a higher temperature on these things. But I'm a big proponent of using... The, and I have to be careful how I explain this, using the lowest temperature you can to get the job done, but you, of course, don't sacrifice joint quality to do that. Uh, you should, of course, use the right temperature that gives you the best quality joint in the shortest possible time. So it's always a trade-off. Soldering temperature is always a trade-off. Yeah, you can increase the temperature right up, use 400 or whatever, and you'll just, you know, breeze through anything. That's no problem whatsoever. But then you risk uh, lifting pads, uh, potentially damaging components. This is more uh, important if you're doing rework and stuff like that. The worst thing you want to do is lift pads. And I've lifted pads at well un at under 370 on like qu crap quality fiberglass boards or whatever. You don't know what you're repairing. And you can easily lift those uh, pads off, especially with the low thermal mass stuff. If you instantly, you know, and tiny little, you know, a SOT23 or an SO pad or something like that, you whack your 370 or 400 on there, you risk list, uh, lifting that up. But on the flip side of that, and what Pace actually uh, advertised this as like a, a full-on production soldering iron that's really super quick in production. And typically, if you're doing production soldering, uh, which is different to rework, you uh, might use a higher temperature in order to get a faster joint because you, you know, you take that risk of, uh, you know, faster joint. It's all a trade-off because it's, it's, it's production time matters. So, you know, temperature's all a big trade-off. So, uh, yeah, this definitely does not match the thermal performance of the JBC, no doubt about it, but that may be completely irrelevant if you solder at higher temperatures. I don't like the fact that the JBC just, you know, doesn't show you the set temperature um, until you lift the damn thing off. I just think that's really annoying. And the other thing is, is that you can't set the temperature with it on the stand. Hold the tool to change the temperature. Bug oh, there we go. Hold the tool to change the temperature. Bugger off. Like, you know, let me change the bloody temperature. Unbelievable. Heck, even my Heiko FXR D with the older uh, technology tips, that will actually breeze through this soldering plane at 
330 as well. No problems whatsoever. Let's give it a go. Sure it will. Yep, no problems. So does that mean the uh, ADS-200 has the same thermal performance as a Heiko FXR Triple Eight? Well, not really. I don't want to imply that. You will actually get a faster thermal recovery and everything else from the uh, direct uh, temperature and especially the ultra performance tips with the high thermal mass. There's no doubt about that, but it's not nearly as good as the JBC. Just saying. Okay, let's just try a thermal test at 370. I've got the wet sponge here. Just gonna whack it on top and drops down to three you can see just showing the recovery here that it doesn't overshoot or anything like that so here you go it drops down to 330 let's try the jbc all right jbc iron same thing oh yeah look at that it drops the same does that recover quicker i think it recovers a little bit quicker and my Heiko, it's actually set to uh, 380. It's not exactly calibrated fantastically. So let's look at the dip on that though. So you can really see the difference between the direct tip technology and uh, the old style just uh, contact technology, I guess for want of a better word, on the uh, Heiko here. And the recovery is not nearly as fast, of course. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's chalk and cheese, as I've done a video uh, explaining. These new modern cartridge uh, direct heater with the uh, temperature sensor in the element, much better than these old style ones. So I could do more testing on that, but uh, really, you know, there, there's no point. It's going to do the business at uh, the higher temperatures. But it was an interesting test that it, it really is not that JBC killer everyone uh, thought it would. But that may or may not matter to you depending on uh, your particular soldering circumstances. It's a fine iron. Let's just say that. There's no worries whatsoever. You know, as I said, you wouldn't use, you know, um, 270 or, you know, even 300. You'd go up to 370, 400 if you're doing like a big uh, ground plane like this. Depends on the component that you're soldering though. If you're doing like a, a you know, a an actual, you know, wire to a ground plane or a, um, like an RF can or something like that, yeah, you're going to up the temperature. But if you've got like a delicate uh, D-pack uh, component that you're uh, reworking or putting on, in my opinion, you're going to want to be doing a, you know, at the lower temperature that you can get away with because uh, there's also the time as well. You know, there's the argument that you can increase the temperature, you do it faster, but it, yeah, it gets to a higher temperature, but it's all over with quicker. So the temperature doesn't, you know, have time to soak in. You use a lower temperature, might take it, you know, a second or two more to get the job done. The temperature's lower, but then the heat's on the component for longer. So it's a bit of a trade-off. Anyway, Pacer are of the opinion that, you know, you probably shouldn't be soldering anything under 370. Well, I, I think it's pretty silly. I've lifted pads way under that temperature. So I could do further testing on that, you know, showing soldering like little 0402s and, you know, SOs and stuff like that. But it's going to do the business. It's a perfectly fine uh, and usable um, cartridge-based soldering iron. It's just, yeah, it's, I think it's just not as good as they claim, that's all. So replacing the uh, tips on this thing, you can either use the uh, supplied silicon uh, mat like that and just whack it in. Whoa, like that. <laughs> Careful with your fingers. Um, and it, of course, heats up uh, pr almost instantly. Or you can use the uh, little uh, tweezer-based ones and whip those out like that. Choose your poison. No wackers. All right, let's just measure the uh, power consumption here. We're talking about 10.7 uh, watts just sitting there idle. It'll occasionally jump up to 40 or 50 like that. So let's see what happens if we apply with our big-ass tip. There we go, now we're on the ground plane. But look, so much for delivery now, 100 and, oh, yeah, there we go, 130. You saw it peak, you saw it peak up to 132 there. But yeah, it's just not doing, it's, it's not continually pumping that in. Wow, let's compare the JBC. All right, JBC, six and a half watts there on idle. Let's take it off, it's heating up, look, oh, 186 peak. Let's put it on exactly the same spot. And this is at 270. Oh no, there we go. No, it's quite similar in, uh, but this is like continually, look, it's continually pumping it out. Whereas the, uh, the pace just wasn't, 
wasn't doing that. Wow, maybe it's worth having a look at the waveform. Look, that's continuous. It knows. I've got to keep pumping that power into the ground plane, please, to, you know, to keep that temperature. The pace just doesn't seem to want to be able to do that. By the way, I do uh, prefer the JBC's little power measurement thing there. I know you're, you know, usually too busy soldering, so I've got that on the ground plane now. But uh, even there, it's not delivering. There we go. Yeah, I think it, you know, matches the 130 watt capability. It's, it's not even delivering all the power it can. All right, let's actually just take a look at the uh, mains waveform. And here it is. And that's with uh, no load. It's just sitting there idle. So you can uh, see it... Uh, occasionally just peak up it's got a, it it should even no it doesn't doesn't time with the lead there oh maybe maybe anyway let's uh let's ground plane this baby so we expect continuous power but it's not doing it's doing a bit more but not continuous I know that is probing the mains input you know before the uh active uh rectification and all that sort of jazz but anyway Still tells you something. Okay, we'll do the exact same thing with the JBC. That's it in uh, sleep mode. It's doing naff all there. Let's take it out. Whoa, look at that. Look at that. Okay, so that's just sitting there idle. Doing jack. So that's just like uh, we got on the on the pace. There we go. It's just a couple of cycles here and there. No wackers. Oh, no. It's doing a similar sort of business. It's not going, it's not going the full Monty. But it's still delivering that power better. There you go. I expected sort of like every peak to, to go. Well, it is only 17. It is only delivering 17% <laughs> power according to the power meter on here, I guess. There you go. You can occasionally see it do better than that. Okay, so I guess that experiment didn't tell us a huge amount. They're operating uh, very similar in terms of, uh, you know, uh, mains, you know, delivered from the mains. I could take the thing apart and actually uh, current probe the power going to the element and stuff like that, but the mains is a decent representation of that. So the things I do like are the, uh, you know, the design and the construction is really like first class, made in the USA, terrific. It, it really feels like a quality bit of uh, kit, and I like that the uh, tips are really very inexpensive and there is a decent uh, range of them so no worries so you know like cost of ownership having a wide range of tips is much better I mean if you buy if you buy into the JBC system for example the tips are very very expensive on those so my conclusion on the Pace ADS200 it is very nice design and build quality apart from that weird PCB but anyway um, it does have the thermal performance not as good as they claim it's definitely not a JBC killer but it is very very nice. I like, you know, the design and the construction, the user interface, I think, uh, you know, quite usable. It's got the three presets. It's just minimal what you uh, need. And it's made in the USA. It's top quality. It's pace. Usually, you know, pace <laughs> gear is very expensive, but they've done awesomely to bring the price price point down on this. So to get a made in the USA, built like a brick dunny, all aluminium uh, construction, everything else, uh, iron, the direct heat, iron, for um, which is re uh, for two hundred and like twenty bucks U.S. Uh, street price is really remarkable and done a fantastic job with all the uh, tips as well for keeping those low price. As I said, you probably want to spend a few bucks more and just get the ultra performance, but you probably want some of the other ones because they're a little bit thinner. Um, so, you know, you might uh, that might help you uh, getting into uh, tighter places and stuff like that so you don't burn the uh, components around you and stuff like that, especially if you're doing rework on boards. You know, you've got all the components sticking up out of the board. You've got to get your iron in there at the right angle and having the little bulge in there could uh, make the difference between hitting a component and not. But the downsides are, as I said, um, the thermal performance isn't as good as uh, claimed. So, you know, it's not going to win any awards there. But it is certainly better than like a Heiko FX Triple Eight, And that's why you pay, you know, almost double for that. You know, this is like a $100, uh, you know, class iron. This is a $200 uh, class iron. It's well worth spending your money on. I recommend getting the cartridge-based uh, systems. So I have a bit of a problem with the uh, display as well. It jumps around like a jackrabbit um, under certain uh, circumstances. Not a big uh, fan of that. I think they need to uh, work on that. I'm not sure what's going on. doesn't seem to be the uh, PID control loop. Uh, you know, like this thing doesn't uh, seem to overshoot. So the thermal performance is fine, but the display just jumps around. So I'm not sure what's doing there. I think they need to look into that. 
And I don't think they've um, implemented the um, the instant setback in this thing uh, very well. So I, I would probably... Um, I was of the opinion that you should probably pay the 30 bucks extra, but now after using it for a bit, I'm, I don't think you probably should. I think, you, you know, you're probably better off saving your 30 bucks, buying a range, buying sort of three extra tips and not worrying about the instant setback. But, eh, some people might like it. I just don't think it's implemented as well as the JBC. And it's not instant. So it's worth considering, I think, if you're in the market for, you know, a $200 class. I'd like to uh, do comparisons with other ones in that class. As I said, Heiko FX uh, 951, um, uh, maybe, you know, an Ursa or something like that. But anyway, um, it's worth considering. Just a few little niggles, but yeah, I, I like the uh, design and feel of it. It's quite nice. So if you liked that video, please give it a big thumbs up. As always, discuss on the EV blog forum or in the YouTube comments down below. Catch you next time.